Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a great discussion. I'd like to thank uh, each of the panelists for the work that you're doing. I think all of us, and to uh, Mr. Evans' point, my, my colleague from Pennsylvania and great friend, you know, I think all of us, uh, both parties, are very interested, um, are grateful, I, would, I should say, to live in a country where uh, there is a safety net, uh, where people can get assistance when they need it, and when there is hopefully a pathway to that family-sustaining job that is really important. And I think these kind of discussions are critical to ensuring that we're doing the best that we can from our level and, and at every level to, to ensure that works. And I think, Mr. Carter, um, some of the uh, points that you made um, are, were really important. All of you did, but uh, you know, I particularly related, you, you talked about families are a unit, and when they go to access programs, it's disjointed and there's silos and it's very difficult to do that. And in my community, there was an initiative before COVID, it sort of fell apart, but uh, where we, all of the individuals and groups came together and created a program and it was aptly named uh, one, uh, one Great Job or something of like that, and essentially measured by people coming into the system and then being connected to a job. But it was it was all of the agencies working together, actually software where they, someone could sort of come into the system and, and be um, referred to help they needed and they didn't have to keep going around. Uh, and I wish we did more to incentivize um, that kind of work rather than creating silos. And so I think to some degree, you know, we're not going to be able to do that at the federal level. It's going to be done at your at your levels um, and, and even at the county level. Um, and so the, the question I have, I guess, and Mr. Carter, back to you again, you talked about uh, Tennessee. Um, uh, you said, I believe before you came there, had the highest level at about $800 million of dollars that weren't spent for some reason. Well, Pennsylvania is right behind that. Right. We were around uh, $700 million. I guess I'd like to understand how that happens. I frankly don't know. And then how can we at the federal level give the states optimum uh, flexibility, uh, but also ensure that there's accountability uh, in the process? So thanks for the question. I would say that how it happens is, um, is a lack of innovation for how to use those dollars to grow the capacity of those served to reduce their dependency. A okay. um, lot of discussion here about, um, about needing more cash assistance. I think that we need more innovation around the intention to help that family grow beyond the vulnerability so that one day they can take the baton of their life and run their own race. We are not, we, we've not designed this intentionally to achieve that objective. So what happens is you have your basic cash assistance and then whatever dollars the state chooses to use to achieve other objectives, a child welfare, child care, what have you. And then that which is in spend, because there isn't a shelf life to it, it just accrues. And so over the course of years in Tennessee, we accrued north of $700 million. It wasn't that we didn't have eligible families, okay? It was that we were not being innovative enough with how to put those dollars to use. And we have, uh, we've, we've turned the, the ship on that. Yeah, th thank you. I'd love to continue that discussion. Mr. White, maybe a, a similar question after what you've seen in, uh, in, in Mississippi. What kind of guardrails uh, should we be thinking about uh, here in this committee and at the federal level to ensure that we don't have a repeat of what happened in Mississippi? Thank you, sir, for the question. And, and I, I just generally point out, I know that there's a, a tension, a natural tension between flexibility and accountability, too. I know agency heads want flexibility to engage in creative practices. And, and as an auditor, it, it's important to just point out, sometimes too much flexibility can send the signal that no one is watching where the money is going. So first you engage in an innovative program, and then you decide, well, I'm going to I'm just going to donate some TANF money to the American Heart Association because I like the American Heart Association and that seems fine. Uh, and then you start spending money on uh, renting an office space that you happen to own 
uh, as a nonprofit head, uh, but you're not actually using the office space. And I think these dominoes fall because people start to believe, the people who are handling the money start to believe that no one is watching. So there, there is a, there's a middle ground balance to strike between flexibility and accountability. And as just another example of an accountability measure that I think strikes that middle ground, Congressman Moore pointed this out. We did a terrible job in Mississippi of tracking outcomes and allowing DHS to track outcomes and then demanding that the agency head sign statements that show how many people were actually helped with TANF dollars. If that measure had been put into place, then I think you would see both a mix of innovation to drive outcomes and accountability where the outcomes would have to be proven to HHS. Thank you.